So if you're interested in doing anything for medical coding or billing, that's what I do. I specialize in helping you pass the exam so you can be certified. Hey, Cece. How's it going? Just waiting on a few more to join before I start. But right now I have my 2022 CPT book up. Um, I've added notes to the codes, added more information to the anatomy that's drawn in there. Things like that will help you during your exam. For sure. Right now I'm working on putting notes together for each section of the CPT book and I need to add some more cases to the no, is it the mail? Is that what I'm doing? No. I was working on the ear last night. The ear section. Adding information to the ear section. That's what I was doing last night. I haven't gotten this one published yet, but I just wanted to add a few more things to it. So let me see if I can find any more examples of ear. So we're in the codes for 69,000 section. Hmm. I do. I have, let's see, 69714. I have another 69714. I have a new example for this one that I can write in. So we have a five year old with diminished hearing. Um. Five-year-old with diminished hearing on the left ear due to chronic otitis media. He has a hearing aid prosthetic device in his ear which have resulted in infections. Parents have decided on an OSSEN-OIN to grated implant to restore his hearing. The mastoid cortex is exposed, spiral drilling is performed to create a pilot hole, a stem of the titanium pedestal is placed in the tunnel adjacent to the core, and subsequently is secured to the fixture. Thank you. We have a way to make this type of look. It's too loose. Ooh, see if Grandma's got any safety pins. Plus, you have a um, sewing machine. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Ha mm hmm I have to run out of How did it get so wet? Mm hmm Do this. Come on. Quit washing things and wearing them soaking wet. I put it on normal on the dryer. It's still... Yeah, and then you got to let it finish. Without taking it out early, hon. It would have dried in the dryer if you put it in there. Sorry, my kids are always interrupting me. 
So the correct code for this one is going to be R67. Six, six, nine, seven, one, four. So I like to pink highlight the ones that were on my CPC exam or the ones that I'm marking up as examples um, in a pink highlighter. Six, nine, eight, oh, one. I'm still finishing up this section before I get it published out there. We have an example here. So we have a five year old with history of hearing aid. That's important to know if you see it again in another question during your exam. Um, and chronic otitis media. Um, we are going to do a OSS E O I N T E G R A T E D. So if you're taking a CPC exam course or any kind of medical billing and coding course and you're given questions through your course or your teacher or practicing with Quizlets or anything else like that, when you get an exam question and you get the right answer, verify that it is correct before just taking the internet's word for it. Um, but once you get back a graded positive um, result, I recommend writing at least two examples per CPT page in your book. That way you have an entire course, if you're taking one, might as well utilize that information and put it in your books. That way you can use it during your exam. Both AHIMA and AAPC allow you to write in your books and you can write whatever you want. Just don't write them in like real question form. All I'm doing is writing a five-year-old with a history of hearing aid and chronic otitis media has this procedure. Yeah. Implant. And the procedure is done through the mastoid cortex. Just because they may describe some of the areas they're cutting into during your question. Um, they use spiral drilling. And a titanium pedestal. Equals. And then I put my codes in a different color so they're highlighted up so that I'm not looking through green blob to find the actual real code. It'll be a different color so that it pops out at me. And what modifier are we using? We are doing the LT because this happens to be on his left. That was bothering him more than anything else. Hopefully y'all can see this. I'm not looking at my camera screen. It's up above my head right now. But that's how I prep the book to add examples in as I find them. I have AAPC's 2022 exam questions um, for exam A, B, C, D, E, and F plus their E and M 
questions for the ENM certification and the auditing certification. And that kind of helps to go through some of those and add some of those examples in just in case they're helpful to somebody that's taken the course. Just looking through these questions to see if there's anything else. Hmm. I wonder if oh, that's a cool word. What is the word A S C I T E S refer to? Is that an abdominal malignancy? Abdominal tenderness, fluid in the abdomen, or enlarged liver. What do y'all think? Anatomy is important to know too during the exam. You got to know what body part they're working on and um, some of the disease processes of it too. Everybody's yelling at me, fluid. Very good. Awesome. IT, sometimes you think of um, infection or something else, and the A is without a lot of times, so that one's a little confusing because this, I don't know, that's a little interesting. We don't really get a lot of help with the prefixes or suffixes there, so that's why I like that one. But I'm almost finished with this ear section. I'm going to be posting that up on Etsy um, tonight at some point. Um, I'm obviously adding examples right now. I've already went through all the codes, put the key information down, AKA terms for sure, um, and then added to the anatomy pretty well too. And then um, have a full description here in three sentences what hearing is and what each body part does so that's pretty helpful I think that's pretty cool so that ought to be ready tonight I'm just trying to make sure I can find every little example I can to add in here from the current exams that I took all night long and all morning long to add some of those in there um, yeah I have just did a TikTok, many of y'all might have seen, but I just posted it today about one of the cases. Now that our AAPC CPC exam is going to be 50 questions smaller, they're adding 10 longer cases at the end. We had heard that they were all going to be mostly ENM, but their website did update today to say that it could be from any area. Or sections of the book um, so I hope it can be I know everybody hates E&M but I have like 50 cases right now that um, it could possibly be so never know something like this it could definitely be uh, they may not be this wordy. They may end up being more like with the ones that are in the study guide. Um, the study guide ones seem to be a little bit smaller sometimes. Their study guide is just a workbook um, from AAPC. And each chapter has 10 questions at the end that you can go through. But the last two questions have always been cases even back in 2018 and 19 they had cases like this is just case one and then case two starts down here and these were fill in the blanks they didn't have any multiple choice back then but um, now we do have some multiple choices the one interesting thing about it hey babe what's up is that you may not just get A, B, C, or D. You might have a few more little options. So that's something else to think about. Right here on one question, we had A, B, C, 
D and E as an option, and then we had A, B, C, and D on the second question. But this one's pretty long, even though it's not very difficult as far as a lot of comorbidities or things that went along with the patient. Um, if you ever wanted to do a screenshot during a TikTok Live, you can just tap on the screen and swipe left. It'll get rid of the chat, and then... Um, you can do a screenshot after that without the scr uh, screen chat being in your way. Just, in fact, it's sad to see. What is sad to see? Hey, guys. Oh, I'm not the best teacher ever. No way. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Re-listening to my lives is so painful because I can audit myself and say, oh, no, that's a mistake. No, that's a mistake. No, I did not explain that very well. Oh, but thank you, Destiny. You're very kind. You're ex oh, Irene, we're doing tutoring tomorrow. Yay. Be sure, if you haven't yet, let me know what you want to go over because um, I'll be prepping with that um, after the live tonight. And in between working on this ear section and getting it posted, I'll be making sure I get enough questions for you. So let me know what sections you want to go over. Usually can do about three sections, you know, like give you a bunch of e &M or cardiology or lab and path, whichever ones you feel are your lowest, especially if you've taken the exam before and didn't pass. You'll get a screenshot of all your scores per section, and we can usually do about three per tutoring. So, yeah, that, those are so much fun to do because the one-on-one -on -one is really nice. I'm going to do a little bit of a, another live tomorrow night, too, because I've got some people that um, cannot make it tonight so we will definitely be doing another one tonight but this is uh this is our patient who's 33 years old who has had um coming in for a pap smear pelvic pain endometrious irregular bleeding she is also an insulin dependent diabetic my hair is falling out onto my screen and i don't want to touch it because it's touch screen um she is insulin-dependent diabetes and questionable thyroid problem. Um, she's had some C-section. She's had a tonsillectomy. Um, she's on Lantus and Ovalog. Um, she smokes 56 cigarettes a day. I find that fun. Um, she's positive for migraines, heart palpitations, abnormal abdominal pain, and anxiety. Sounds like she's a normal hormonal female like us all. And her periods are lasting two weeks long, which makes it hard for her to control her um, diabetes during that time. So they want to make sure and get her some lab work done, some ultrasounds done to see um, and probably end up recommending her for a hysterectomy. <clears throat> so what would you code this level? Would it be a 99211? She is a repeat patient. Um, a 212, 213, 214, or a 215. And even if you're taking your exam online, <clears throat> you can use a dry erase marker and you can draw on your screen and then just wipe it off. So. Um, you can still do the process of elimination with writing on your screen if you wanted to. I would definitely get rid of the nurse visit. And the 15 I would get rid of because she's probably, um, you know, if we add like um, CKD, COPD, and on dialysis or something, she would end up being a 15. But just for what she's got, I wouldn't consider her that. I don't think she's very straightforward. Um, so either she's going to be moderate, too complex, that kind of thing is how I would eliminate these to get it down to where you're just like a 50-50 shot for sure. Um, 
if we look at our 215 and 214, no, 213 and 214, 214 is moderate, the 213 is still pretty low. Um, out of those two, if a physician gets gets a two one three just for reconciling medications, no matter even if they only have one diagnosis, that might give you a hint. Also, on your lovely chart that you have in these CPT books, if we look at it, I like looking at this middle area right here. We need to at least have something here. If we're going to pick the 13, she's supposed to only have one stable chronic illness. But she has her insulin-dependent diabetes and then other illnesses going on with her irregular periods and all that stuff. So she has at least two stable chronic illnesses. So this chart will refer you to 214 if that's helpful in the least little bit. We don't get an MDM or anything else out of this um, and this stuff will come right off on your screen if you just wipe it off. So it's super easy to deal with if you're going to use a dry eraser during your exam if you're taking it online at home because the pen stuff won't work. Um, D is definitely going to be our answer there. Now for her diagnosis, they're only asking for her primary, so you know not everything's going to be listed. So if it's her primary, we really wouldn't use an R diagnosis because you know those are symptoms, right? Um, her diabetes, there is a guideline with her diabetes. If her diabetes, okay, well diabetes will be primary if it's the reason for her illness or the um, the condition that she's being seen for. Now her regular menstrual cycle isn't controlled by her diabetes. So it won't be that. Um, and Z's are often history of and usually not a first diagnosis unless it's for a well child exam or, or she's there for chemotherapy. We might get a Z first. So I would get rid of that and just leave this in so that I wouldn't have to even open up a diagnosis book to even look those up and you know for my exam purposes Anytime I can save not being in the books and trying to read descriptors um, is helpful. So just thinking things out logically that we know um, can be really helpful there. <laughs> Me too, Beth. I have, um, I'm using my cell phone that's connected to the internet and hopefully with the Wi-Fi attached. So hopefully we won't have any pauses and hopefully it will record, but I'll be repeating most of all this tomorrow night anyway. So it's okay, Beth, don't worry. Like I said, I'm just going on for just a little bit just to help those that are used to seeing me on Friday nights. But I know a lot of people and probably will end up switching it over to Saturday nights anyway, because ever since the New Year's, it just seems like it's a better fit for a lot of people to do Saturday night instead of Friday nights. Everybody's finished with the week. They got stuff to catch up on right after work. It's pretty difficult to get on to the live. So whatever. I'm happy to do whatever. <laughs> You're welcome, Beth. You get to feeling better. So here's our answers. We got the 214 and then N92.1. We do have um, rationale. So, um, it says her medical decision-making level was moderate um, due to the number and complexity of the problems addressed during the um, encounter, plus an undiagnosed problem with uncertain prognosis. 
so that thyroid thing kicks her up to 14 also. So diabetes is usually sequenced first when it is the cause of the disorder, which is not the case here because of her irregular menses, right? So I told y'all that. And um, because the note reads that she bleeds for two weeks on and off, and this is her quote that's in quotes, this is what they're calling her chief complaint for the day is her bleeding irregularly so her dysmenorrhea is definitely what they're going to diagnose her with that day so i hope that's helpful here's another case not as big but definitely something that we're seeing a lot of right now we have chest congestion runny nose cough and fever number one do we code symptoms like this. We really try not to. Our guidelines are not to code them. If we can, if we have a definitive diagnosis given to us, then we don't use these. Um, I encourage my doctors to use this in real life instead of an, uh, a multi- dose um, diagnosis like URI or even pneumonia or asthma because those are tied to MIP scores which are tied to payment methodology for bonuses at the end of the year. If you diagnose somebody with a URI and they're given antibiotics within two weeks before, two weeks after their diagnosis, it's counted against you and they could be seen with other issues that arise that got them the antibiotic, but it doesn't matter if you gave them a multi-dose um, diagnosis. So just some real life world statement there that sometimes in real life, it's better to use the symptoms. <laughs> it really is because, uh, yeah, if you're going to give them any antibiotics, there's these overutilization of um guidelines that the doctors can get in trouble for and lower um, scores through the health plans and you get dinged on reimbursements or signing contracts for the next time you sign contracts well your doctors overuse antibiotics all the time we're not going to send you our patients those kind of things can in real life do make a difference um, but as a medical auditor which I am that's part of my job, is to come up with solutions for those kind of problems. But um, here in our learning how to code world here, we are absolutely not supposed to use these, if at all possible. But we have a 42-year-old male who was seen for cough and all that stuff. Sore throat, he's been using Mucinex. He's not allergic to anything. His height, weight, temp are normal-ish. That's funny. They have, I copied and pasted this too. So they have this as 42 here, and then down here they have it as 72. So that's very interesting. I'll have to alert AAPC. They got some typos in here. That's interesting to see. Oh, my computer is deciding that I'm being mean to it. So let me reset this real quick. Come on. I have way too many tabs open as usual. As always, that's just me. I've always got so many projects in the in the fire. Let's try it now. There we go. So this either 42 or 72 year patient is most definitely um, having a rough time. His skin's pink, warm and dry and tacky. Um, they are going to be doing some rapid flu screening, and they did find that he's positive for type influenza A, but not for B. 
So he is going to be diagnosed with influenza. They're going to write him a prescription for an antiviral, which is Tamiflu, and some promethazine for his nausea. That's um, hydroxine is also what they call it over the counter. Uh, not over the counter, but prescription. It can be also called hydroxine. I have like 40 bottles here at the house. And told him to go home and have some fluids and follow up for a reeval. The billing part of this, and they have one more thing to check, is that the patient returned at 4 p.m. to have his blood pressure checked. So, he was seen in the morning, asked to come back for a blood pressure check. Sometimes they do that. Um, um, either the patient's blood pressure was really high, or he had, a lot of people have white coat syndrome, and just while they're seeing the doctor, they absolutely cannot get a blood pressure check. They have to come back <laughs> at the end of the day after they got their prescriptions, and everything's cool, and they don't have to see the doctor, then they can get their blood pressure, and they're usually fine. I can be that way sometimes. Billing information for this patient is that the patient um, had a date of service and signatures are always met. He's been an established patient. He's billed with Medicare before with a 99214. He has uh, nurse checks frequently on um, returns, and that's it. So what would we bill this patient for today's visits? Do we give them, for the um, influenza part A, they want us to answer here. And then for the return nurse visit, they want us to answer here. So the first visit with the physician for his um cough, runny nose, and stuff, we definitely wouldn't do the nurse visit right there. And he definitely wouldn't be a 215 because he's not, you know, circling the drain with CKD and um, diabetes and hypertension and COPD. he need to be having a whole lot of stuff to get you a 15. So between those, the 12, 13, and 14, what would y'all code for this one? Are we still skipping? Hey, Paris. Miss Paris is all certified now. She is my tutor, tutoring. Per, I tutored her on like New Year's Eve ish. And that night she stayed up or got up and took her CPC exam before she went to work. So. She had tutoring with me right after she got off alpha of work, so like 6 p.m. at night, for a couple of hours with me. And then at 1.30 in the morning, I think she got up and started taking her CPC exam online, both parts, A and B, all before she went to work at, you know, 8, 7, 8 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and she passed, by the way. She certainly did. So congratulations, Paris. Good to see you there. She wore, I mean, I don't know. She must have been up for 48 hours straight. And then there was a glitch in AAPC system that gave her a score of zero and returned that result back to her. <laughs> she had to call them and go, what? You're killing my soul. Don't do that. I did not make a zero on this exam <laughs> with all that effort. So bless her heart. She's a um, from Tennessee, too, just like me. So she worked really hard for that. Tutoring all the night, the night before, and then getting up really early and taking the test before going to work. That's, that's dedication right there. So great job. <laughs> she waited a whole week with a zero. Oh, my gosh. The one thing that really did help her, I believe, was um, making the notations in anesthesia and moving those um, modifiers over from the HitPix book. So if you've never done that, be sure and do that. 
Our previous exam that she took had 10 anesthesia questions. Um, under this P1, you need to write in all these anesthesia modifiers that are not in this book. They're in a HIPPICS book. Transfer them over because AAPC likes to use this. But our new exam for 2022 is only going to have four anesthesia questions. They're cutting this section way down. It's still going to help you to get these moved over. You just won't have 10 whole questions um, of an anesthesia. But we are guessing 213, 213. Yeah, be sure and do that, Destiny. It's super important. AAPC loves using those modifiers. The AA, the anesthesiologist doing the anesthesia himself or supervising four or more surgeries at one time or monitoring a CRNA with a MAC monitored anesthesia are their four favorite for sure. No one's going with the 12. Everybody's going with the 13. What are you doing for the nurse visit at the end of the day? What are we coding for that one? When he came back and got that blood pressure checked. Are we doing an 11? Are we adding a modifier? Or we're not billing for that service? What are we doing? Sorry, I ran off to say hello to my mom. Okay. <laughs> Changing to A. What are we doing with the second one? You saying no, no additional services are billed for that nurse visit at the end of the day? So our answers are the 213, and there are no additional charges for the end of the day either. So our decision level making is below for just a normal influenza A and a couple of prescriptions. His blood pressure didn't need to be billed for the end of the day. So we're good there. Not too difficult. Y'all are going to be able to do these cases. It's not going to hurt too bad. They're just going to be a little bit longer. I'm going to teach you this process of elimination you're going to be able to bank some time on these questions that will give you some more time on those. If even the first case that I did, I did two TikToks on it and it took me six minutes to think through. Reading the um, op note was three minutes. Then considering my answers and answering it took me three more minutes. Now, for the CPC exam, you're given now, since they've updated it, 2 minutes and 60 seconds per question to answer. Some of these questions are going to be super easy to answer, and you're not going to have to use a whole um, 2 minutes and 60 seconds to answer. You're going to know the answers pretty quick, and you're going to bank yourself some time so that you save some time for those last cases at the end. I could have done the case a lot faster, but I was trying to teach and, and um, share a little knowledge during that of the process of what you would go through through these questions. 
in answering these cases because the process of elimination is a little different. Unlike the normal part of your, you're going to have 90 questions that are more like this, where you're going to have groups of codes. You're going to be evaluating them to see what goes with what. Um, and it's going to be more of the process of elimination. Like here, I know we're doing a 91. What is our 91 code? Anybody that's done tutoring with me knows what 91 is. And it's one of our most favorite codes to have to code because it's super, super easy. And that's because it is critical care. Critical care is the easiest thing in the world to code because you don't read the code descriptors. You go straight to this chart that is on page 33 if you're in the 2022 book. And all you do is put in your time, and that will tell you exactly how to code it. It'll tell you however many number codes you're going to use. So it's super easy. Love it when it's critical care. This one's pretty cool, and why I added it is because we have lots of time here that we're going to end up probably having to add up, right? So we also need to make sure, don't just look at the numbers and then add everyone together assuming it's all critical care. Make sure it's really the critical care that you're doing. So we have a COVID-19 patient who's hypoxic and ven ventilation management of critical care is the 62. The same provider returns and documents 55 minutes more of critical care. Good, so we can add that one there. And then the last one says, same day the staff engages in the patient for diabetes, stage three ulcer, and documents their time as 29 minutes. So the issue is, do we add that last 29 minutes? Do we get to count the staff's time in dealing with the patient's diabetes and ulcer when it's endocrine staff? The patient's still in critical care. Our time, if we say no, this is 7, and then this is 11, right? If we do it with, we've got 62, 55, and then we add the 29. So we got 14, 15, 16, 11, 12, 13, 14, 146 minutes, or 111, or 117 minutes. Sometimes they can fit in the same category. hundred and seventeen minutes is different than our 146 most definitely so according to our chart if we're saying no to the endocrine people coming in and dealing with diabetes, we're right here at the 91 and the 92 times 1, right, no, times 2, right down here. The 117 is down here. So it's the 91 and then the 92 times 2. So we just got to look for an answer that says the 92 times 2 And that helps us at least narrow down the answer so that we can get a 50-50 shot here. Now we need to figure out if we're doing the 99233 or the 99232 code.
So our 992 Our 99232 is subsequent hospital care. Our 99233 is subsequent hospital care. One of them is moderate, and one of them is, is high. So we just need to decide whether we are, our MDM meets the criteria for high. He's got quite a bit of comorbidities with the COVID going on, right? And that's not what endocrine is taking care of. They're doing diabetes and a stage 3 ulcer. And they documented 29 minutes. Let's look at our time. We have under the 2-3, no, the 3-2, sorry. We have 25 minutes. And then the 3-3 three, three, has what minutes 35 minutes so that can be helpful we definitely were not able to do the 35 minutes so we can't do the 33 based off that we are a little over the 25 but it's better to keep it there than it is to bill anything else differently so definitely we're going to keep our d and move on to our next question. <laughs> Does that make sense, Kim? I looked at our subsequent hospital care. MDM isn't told in this by the physician. You are given clinical leeway to think about it yourself and decide whether that's high or not. But I did have the option of having a time listed. So if they have a time listed and times available or a difference in any of your ENM codes, some of them don't have it, but some of them do. Even some of these hospital ones have time. And you can go over it, you just can't ever go under it. So it being 30, 29 minutes, I would stick with the three two most definitely and not pick the 35 if I did not have time listed I would have to use my judgment and remember AAPC likes to make sure that you undercode you're not overcoding undercoding is still fraud but if your choice is between a lower code and a higher code you have no other way to look at it and no idea which one to pick, pick the lower number just in case. It's not 100% fail-safe practice, but it's more often correct than it isn't. So that's my advice on that one. Hmm, it's interesting, but it's a brand new question from 2022, guys. So... These kind of things may come up. It's most definitely a 2022 question. I had to take some CEUs yesterday, and I use AAPC to do my certification, and I got them from AAPC for January of 2022. So, mm hmm. Here's y'all a good one. Which of the following is not bundled service when it's in critical care? Since we're just talking critical care now, what is not included? Ventilator, ventilator management, gastric intubation, emergent trach, or vascular as access? Yeah, they could be. That's why I'm like, if these are January 22 questions that I was asked for my continuing education that just popped up yesterday, 
And I know they're updating their site so that their exam will go live on the 14th or 15th of this month. Um, then we're really close. I also purchased all of 22 exam questions for exam A, B, C, D, E, and F. I also bought the exam questions for the E&M certification um, speciality. I also bought the ones for the auditor speciality. And I may do cardiovascular or some other specialities because those are fun questions. I like those. Seeing some new insight on those. And they have all these speciality certificates for each section of the CPT book. And then they give you 50 cases for each one of those to answer. And uh, I like those speciality certificate questions. You can buy them on the AAPC website. Um, they can be quite costly, though, like $400 to buy. And that's just like a set of three to go along with your study guide and stuff. So I have them. I'll be um, picking out which ones I think are, are the best for practicing the CPC exam and um, changing them up so that I'm not dealing with copyright issues. But the same sort of premises will be involved so that you get the full benefit without having to spend all that money. And unless you got it, if you've got it, go for it. They're great practices. Um, I wouldn't recommend doing the uh, CPC ones yet, the exam A, B, C, D, and F, because they haven't changed. There's still some of the same questions that were from 2019, 20, and 21 in there. Um, not much new ones yet. I'm hoping by the 15th they update those questions and um, those are updated for the 2022 exam year. But right now they're not. Where I got these questions from was from my CEU for continuing education. And those had been updated for us that have already got our CPC, but we needed to keep our continuing education those were updated yesterday, so hopefully after the 15th, maybe go purchase those other ones if you want to, but don't do it yet. Some of those same questions. So this one is C. Emergent trach is correct, and the emergent would have kind of clued you in a little bit. Now, process of elimination gets me to liken the V and the V. But it ended up not being those. The answer is C that they wanted. You didn't miss anything. I'll post this on YouTube. Plus, I'm going to do another live tomorrow night. Because I have a lot of members of our chat group that can't be here tonight. One's sick. And um, another one's working. So, I'm going to repeat my two cases that I already went over today and then um, these questions for tomorrow too. So don't worry. You didn't miss much. The bundles vary in price depending on whether you're an AAPC member or not and um, they depend on whether you buy your membership at the same time or not and based off of if you get the guides, books, and all kinds of other stuff um, with it. It d just all depends on what you're buying. But AAPC has them all on their website. Does anybody know what CRM stands for? I really wish I had... I was taking my exam before the 15th but yeah I don't think they're letting anybody they've embargoed the exam from the 1st through the 14th I don't think they're letting anybody take it right now so the 15th I believe will be the first day anybody can take it online or in person so will be the weekend they only do them like on the weekends when is that so the 15th will be the first day that any chapters can give it, or the 22nd, so. Let 
We don't know what we're going to expect until we see it. So, CRM, if you don't have this abbreviation in the back of your CPT book, you have this um, back page that has acronyms and abbreviations in the back of it. If CRM, is that even in here? Mm. CPs and CSs. I don't see that one on here. It's not even there. So you can write it in on the back of that page if you don't have it, because this is one of my questions for continuing education for 2022. So it may be an area that they're looking at because everybody's worried about patient satisfaction scores and stuff like that. And they seem to trend towards what the employers are looking at. So are we talking about relations? relationships rule or relationships is it maintenance marketing management or management what do y'all think yeah Saturdays are pretty I think in person their days to do them in person yes B is correct. Customer relationship management. And those are also tied to um, payment scores for contract negotiations back with the health plans. If your patients are filling out satisfaction surveys to the health plans to relay them um, information. I know every time I see the physician, I get a email. I get cards in the mail wanting to know how my visit was. If you actually fill those out, that is actually counted. It goes to the group, it goes to the health plan, everybody and their brother, and it gets probably posted on the internet. Combined with other scores, people's scores, not yours individually, but they're all combined. I work in California, so I can go to cal.gov and then go to the medical groups and health plans and see their patient satisfaction scores. And their renewal contracts are tied to those. Along with those contracts I was talking to about those MIP scores, about prescribing too many antibiotics or too many radiology appointments, um, even too many pap smears. They get invasive about, you know, if you're doing them yearly, you're not supposed to be do getting a pap smear yearly in case you didn't know. And if you do get one yearly, it's counted against your primary care physician if you do, because that's supposed to be overutilization of um, resources. Good gracious. But we'll keep talking. I'll show you one of those questions here in a minute. Here's another E&M one about how is an established patient's encounter coded when the patient has a chronic condition is not at goal, they have limited data and there is no prescription drug management. That is an interesting question. This was on my CPC uh, continuing education for 2022 question. Instead of telling you an MDM or a time like they've been known to, now they're just asking random randomness that you would have to use that lovely chart in E&M to figure out whether it's a 213, a 212, or a 214. I know we're not going to be at 215, right? They're not draining this, you know, circling the drain here. They got one chronic condition that is not at goal. So one condition. What do you get when you have one condition? Anybody want to take a guess at this one? It's in your chart, in the front of the E&M section. Your one illness. So, our 2112 is one problem. 
But a problem is not an illness. A problem is I stubbed my toe. I got an ingrown toenail. It's not a condition, not an illness. I have um, a laceration to my eye. I have metal in my eye. I slam my finger in the car door. Those are all minor problems. That's a 2112. When you have an illness, one illness, we're at 213. If we're at two illnesses, diabetes and hypertension, we're at a 214. If we're only at one medication reconciliation, no matter the illness, we're at a 213. Two, by the way. So our answer for this one, for one chronic condition, is our B213. I hope that's helpful. If I start school this semester, so I need 2022 books, um, you don't even have to go to school to take your exam, number one, and you don't need 2022 books for all of 2022. You can use 2021 books. I have a document on Etsy that's 25 pages long. It'll help you turn your 2021 book into a 2022 book by showing you what codes to add on what page and what codes to delete or what verbiage you need to delete on certain codes. It's not as traumatic as going through the entire book and fixing all your out of sequence codes that I have y'all do. That takes more time. So you can definitely use your 2021 books all of 2022 you cannot use them for 2023, so if you don't end up passing and end up going over into 2023, you cannot use your 2021 books then. But you most definitely can use your 2021 books now and for the entire year, no matter what your teachers tell you. Um, you can turn those books into 2022, which I recommend. Absolutely, 100%. And I have a $30 document that you can do that with on Etsy. Save you 400 bucks for the books. Um, but you don't even need a course. You don't have to take any courses to be a CPC or a medical certified coder. So I don't even recommend a book, um, a course. They're mostly stressful, busy work. But yes, ask away. Lovely questions. Love to help answer. Based on current screening guidelines, how often should women between the ages of 21 and 29 who have not undergone a complete hysterectomy be screened for cervical cancer, meaning get your pap smears? Is it every five years? Every three years? Um, they need... Once every three years, or they need a pap smear every three years, either alone or with an HPV co-test every five years. Or patients in this range do not need to be screened if they have been vaccinated against HPV. You're welcome. Thanks, Def Destiny, for the feedback. That helps. This is right up my alley. This is what I do as a HEDIS auditor. Um, if you ever end up wanting to get out of medical coding, but want to use your CPC to get into auditing, you can most definitely do HEDIS auditing. The guidelines are going to be in black and white. They'll tell you what... CPT codes to use with what diagnoses and what the guidelines are. There's no vague about it. It's black and white. 
There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. You either do it this way or not. And you just help your health plans or your medical groups um, learn about the measures and stay in compliance as much as they can. I don't think all these non-practitioners, because these guidelines are written up by insurance policy makers, should be involved in taking care of you as a patient, but health care is what it is in the United States, and we have to find ways to stay compliant, to help our groups achieve as much as they can financially so that they can keep their heads above water and keep us on payroll. I usually make enough to cover my salary with one health plan throughout the group um, for an entire year, just in a matter of whatever year-end bonus they get for not over-utilizing resources and staying in compliant and getting patients' measures done like their mammograms and their colonoscopies. So they get these checks back, and I'm like, ooh, that's my salary right there. They got it all back. That's great. Now there's nine more health plans to go to get the bonuses from. So I always feel good seeing those end-of-year um, results come back. Plus, I know I'm helping out a lot of patients, making sure that they get their paps and mammograms and colonoscopies. This one particular measure, a lot of people have issues with. Lots of people like to get their stuff done yearly. You might miss something if you go three or four years without one. But I didn't write all these. These actually come from usually Canada. They put in place all these guidelines and measures and test them out on their population because they have universal health care for everyone. And they find out which scenarios work the best to control cost but keep all their population healthy. Since they pay for every citizen's health care, they want to make sure they stay healthy. They don't want to not test if it's not needed. But then again, they don't want to bring them in and test them multiple times if it's not needed. So they do a really good job. We adopt everything that they do. So it's funny how people don't want universal health care, but all of our measurements and guidelines and rules, even the ICD-10, uh, CPT, hip picks, all these books are written for and adopted by Canada first. <laughs> So the answer is B. You are supposed to get a pap smear once every three years in that age group right there. I don't ever talk to my physicians about this guideline. I might tell them once a year about this one, and they all bark. <laughs> and then if you try to tell your patient, don't come in for your pap smear, come back and see me in three years, then they call the health plan and complain that your doctor doesn't want to see me and they're just brushing me off and telling me they don't I don't need a pap smear but once every three years how dare they then your patient satisfaction scores go down it's just a nightmare this one's a can of worms that I don't even open so I, I don't even I tell them it's out there but I never promote it I never ask them ever 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 to tell patient don't come back yearly for your pap ever no we ain't going there now, will I stop their claims if they're giving patients antibiotics and saying they have a URI? Yep, I'll send it back to them and say, please diagnose this patient with a cough, runny nose, and sore throat. <laughs> Since you wrote them an antibiotic, it's going to be counted against you. That does no harm to patients, right? But we could be doing harm to patients by not giving them their pap smear every year. I agree with the patients on that. If they want to come in and they have the gumption to do that every three years, no one should say something about it. And this doesn't even take into account your parents' history, your family history. You know, it's crazy. Don't like this rule, but I'm sure there's a reason for it.
Immunizations. Immunizations. This one's on Gardasil. And so you can tell AAPC is getting pretty... I mean, they're noticing cervical cancer guidelines and a measure that is very difficult to get. We um, have a hard time. We can get childhood immunizations. The first tetanus, the hepatitis Bs, we can get the polios, we can get the MMRs and the varicellas most of the time. What we can't get is the... Um, Gardasil, when kids are 11 to 13, to prevent genital herpes, HPV, and we can't get um, the lung one. There's there's a lung vaccine they get at the same time that when they're sharing pipes, <laughs> they give this uh, encephalitis thing from uh, trying out marijuana for the first time and sharing a bong. So... Um, because we have such a hard time collecting and getting patients in to get these vaccines, of course, we're being audited more frequently, and payment methodologies are based off the hardest ones. Every time you meet a measure, they pull that carrot stick out and move it further. There's no way you can convince parents to bring their 11 to 13-year-old in for a vaccine for a sexually transmitted disease. I mean, it, it, it could even help prevent oral herpes, you know, this canker sores, but parents will not hear it. They won't do it. They will not bring those kids in. And then they need two of these six months apart. So we're stuck between a hard place and a guideline that's paid a bonus on that we need to keep our practices going to pay for insurance and you know there's every blood pressure cuff has to be audited by this company that comes in and make sure it's valid and producing good results every scale that you get weighed on has to have that done yearly there's so much in medicine that goes on behind the scenes not only with salaries and paying for the electricity but um Every little bit helps that we might get, but you absolutely cannot get parents to bring their kids in for this one. Um, AAPC knows that and knows it's tied to a guideline that we are struggling with as a country, so it is in our exam questions now. So it's good to know a little bit about what's going on with some of this stuff and know why they're asking our questions. I can see how money and where it trickles down to is influencing the questions, is my thought there. So, which one of these sets is correct? And how do you get it down to 50-50 pretty quickly? Are I don't like y'all memorizing a lot of codes at all, but a few times I'll say, now remember this one, you know, this one's important. Like our 99100 in anesthesia is for any of our patients who are less than a year old or over 70 who need anesthesia. If the CPT code descriptor does not have an age in it, you need to use that code if your patient is of those ages. That one I want you to remember. This one I want you to remember. The Z23 is the code, diagnosis-wise, that you use for immunizations, no matter age. It doesn't matter if they're two years old, uh, anything. That's the one we're going to use. So I know right away I can get rid of these Z12s because it's not that. So then the only difference is between these two up here. That gets you up to a 50-50 shot. For sure. So that's helpful. So if we go look it up, our 90649. So slow at turning these pages. 
brand new book too. 90649. And they put in all these weird codes above it. COVID is just all over the place in here now too. 49. 49 says it's an HPV vaccine type 6, 11, 16, 18, and it's quadrillant. The 51 is an HPV vaccine that is 6, 11, 16, 18, 31, 33, 42, 52, and 58. How do you know which one's Gardasil vaccine? I'll show you in the book here. This is all you get is, sorry it's so dark, I don't know why. The room is like brightly lit. But we've got 49 and 51. How would you know the difference if there's no name brand written down? That one's two to three doses. This is just the three dose up there. Kind of interesting, right? You need to make sure you, if you run into questions like this and somebody tells you which one it is, that you've got the right thing going on. The answer is the 51. It's the one with the more range, the more variants. It's um, the one that we absolutely call is our Gardasil. The 49 is a 4 variant, and the 50 is a 2 variant, but um, and it covers the, it's a 9 variant, sorry, not the 2 variant, it's a 9 variant, where the 49 covers the 4 variant. This is the 9 variant. It has a 9V in it. And the other one, the 49, is a 4 variant. So, Gardasil is the 9 variant. That's the, definitely the one you want to make, make a note of. Go on and write the um, manufacturer's given name for that one. And I had both my boys done. They have it, so they don't have to worry about that oral canker sores, at the very least, when they start kissing on them cootie ridden girls but they're not allowed to date until they're after their age of 26 because that's when the brain stops developing so once they get that thing good and developed then maybe i'll let them date we'll see how long that lasts but that's that's the golden rule right now while they're 12 and 13 in the house no dating till then <laughs> Yeah, and they could get the cervical cancer from it, so from the HPV, so it's a uh, very scary stuff. Here's our next one, which is which the following does not make more like make does not make it more likely that you're going to get cervical cancer and we're looking for not issues which one does not is it a weak immune system long term use of oral prescription birth control becoming sexually active at a later age three or more of the full term pregnancies Which one's not true? Which one is not a risk factor for cervical cancer? Anything that's referring to how sexually active you are or not 
is not a risk factor in cervical cancer. Sex doesn't play a role in it, except for catching HPV in, in it. But that's the answer that they're wanting for AAPC. B having sex later in life is, is definitely not one of the risk factors. Oops, I froze my computer again. <laughs> Good job, Brittany. I gotta change this page real quick. Fold this laptop up and get it to talking to me again. <clears throat> Probably help if I updated it. I haven't turned it off and turned it back on and since I purchased it <laughs> during Christmas when I broke the screen of my other one. All right, let's see. It's time for a reboot. All right, our next one is which information, well, informational tool is available to check whether Medicare is a second payer? Is it the Medicare Identification Questionnaire, Medicare Secondary Payer Questionnaire, Coordination of Coverage Questionnaire, or none of the above? Hey, Mrs. Hey, Scott. How's it going? Anybody know where you check benefits at? Process of elimination gets me to Medicare and Medicare because questionnaire and questionnaire is the same, Medicare and Medicare are the same. So then I just have to decide whether I'm under identification or second payer. My question is asking me about second payer. So B is your answer. I've never run benefits or checked um, insurances, so it's something that I wouldn't have known at all as an auditor. I don't do that kind of stuff. I make sure that their systems are secure um, and correct identification numbers and that they're collecting the data correctly, but I don't run patients' insurances. so. Um, it was something that I didn't know, but I just broke it down by using just the process of elimination. Had no idea what it could have been. And Medicare and questionnaire are the same. Then it broke it down to just the middle words were the one. And since it just said secondary payer there, I was like, okay, well, let's see if it's secondary payer then. So that was just my thinking on that question. Some of them are not that ridiculously interesting like that the match up in the question is part of the answer so it was just a fluke but a nice fluke somebody else might know this MSPQ y'all probably give it an abbreviation no one would ever walk around saying Medicare second payer questionnaire so I'm sure <laughs> Smurfy goes around checking those benefits all the time looks like they probably call it an MQ or something. Probably even lighten it down even further as all they can. So here we go. Here's another one that's new question that I thought AAPC is really going towards these COVID um, type questions too for this 2022 year that was on my certification CEU thing for January. Um, a subacute cough can last how long after the initial code, cold, or a respiratory infection? Is it 48 to 72 hours, 5 to 7 days, 3 to 8 weeks, or 4 to 6 months? How long?
How long does your cough usually last when you catch a cold? Ever since that we've been wearing these masks for two years, knock on wood, I have not had a cold. My last cold was um, MLK weekend in Vegas in 2019. I got the worst cough. It lingered forever. I could not even lay down in bed for like two weeks. It was terrible. C is our answer. Three to eight weeks, your cough can linger after just a common cold. And I remember my last one because it was February, the last weekend in February. We went to Vegas and spent the night at the Cosmo. Um, no. Mirage. Somewhere. My mother had bought us uh, rooms for Christmas. So we used them for MLK weekend. And um, I caught a cold. Took me a good three weeks to get over that cough. It just lingered forever. And it was just a cough. But it started with a tickle in the throat. Used hot tea forever. And developed a cough. So just a regular cough can last three to six, three to eight weeks. Here's a good one. We do a lot of integumentary stuff and um, removing tumors and stuff, but don't get a lot of anatomy questions about it. So this was new. Also with my um, 2022 questions, one of my new ones. I like the way they had it worded. Um, if a provider removes as much of the tumor as possible just to aid in the patient's chemotherapy or to help prolong their life but can't remove all of the tumor, what's that called? Is it debulking, marsipolization, ablation, or a resection? What do they call that? What do y'all think? There's no real way to do process of elimination here. They're all starting out with this different letter. Um, we have three that end in the ION, which is nice, but no real way to do anything here. You just need to know that one. Hey, Miss Magoo. We got some ablations. I have a, a friend who's had an ablation. Their heart had too many heartbeats. It had a heartbeat here and a heartbeat here. It was just beaten. And both those heartbeats were uh, competing against each other to pump blood through the heart. And it would pump, 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 and then pump, 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 pump. And then pump, 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 pump. It was just crazy fighting with each other. And what controls the heartbeats are all these nerves that are connected to the muscle. And some of those nerves were um, just misfiring, going all crazy and telling the heart to burt at different patterns. So each little nerve was telling the heart muscle to beat at a different pattern. And they weren't talking to each other anymore to tell them when to pump and when not to. So the cardiologist went in and severed all the nerves around the heart except for one and left that one to tell the heart when to pump. And that is an ablation. They use an electric cartery thing um, to cauterize the nerves and sever their, their connections. But anyway, that's my little story about about what ablation is. So ablation is not the answer. Anybody else want to take another guess? Resection. Good choice. I would pick that too, but still not the right answer. It's funny. They call it debulking. 
taking some of the bulk out, which is funny word. That's why I picked the question, because I've never seen one written like that by AAPC. And then I thought the word was funny. That's how el elementary of a word. We're going to debulk it? <laughs> really? That's what you're going to call it when, we, when you're removing part of a tumor to prolong someone's life? You're not going to give it a cool name like ablation or resection? These are all really cool words, you know. Debulking? Sounds like I'm going to the grocery store and ordering rice in bulk or something so yeah it's debulking very interesting right <laughs> i liked it i think my computer froze again sorry guys let me readjust this thing one more time this um laptop is kind of interesting because you fold it in half with the keyboard becomes inverted and is the bottom that you put down on a desk or whatever it's the keyboard which is interesting because I think it's getting hit the keyboard is getting hit and freezing it when it's supposed to be completely turned off when I flip it around And let me unplug it because it's completely charged now. Plug this up into my phone. But my phone and my laptop and everything all uses the same charger. So that's super easy and nice. Okay. Finally, a CPT code one. We have, if we're doing the process of elimination, by just looking at the numbers numerically, to have an idea what we're going to do, all the first numbers are the same, second, third, and fourth are all the same. And then we have a difference of one, two, three, and four. Oh, great. So we just need to go to the first code and see what it is. I like to take at least two codes at a time and then find out what the differences are and then eliminate or keep those based off the codes and doing a word search to figure out if they match anything in our question. So 53451 is 53451 and then 52. 5-2 is easier to read because it is a child code. Parent codes are indented closer to the CPT code. Child codes are everything that this is, but only what's after the semicolon. So um, it changes to this, where this is bilateral. This turns into unilateral. If you see that semicolon, it, you delete all of that and then just do this one. So I like um, looking at the child first, figuring out this is unilateral, that one's bilateral. Hmm. The 53 is removal. And 54 is an adjustment. Not too bad there. So we have our keywords to search. We'll start at the bottom, work our way backwards to see we are unilateral. So the 52 is looking really good. I just want to make sure my route is the good part. Is this the P2? Is it P? It is because our parent code is that word. So, unilateral it will be. B has got to be our answer. That should only take you less than 30 seconds to do, is, is just figuring out what the differences are on the code and answering those that way. Instead of taking your whole two minutes and uh, 40 seconds, whatever it is, 60 seconds, 40 seconds to do these. But that should be it. That is all I had prepped for tonight. I'll go over these and a lot more tomorrow night when I do a live um, to catch up on um, some of the people that missed it out tonight. Hopefully this records and I can post it on to YouTube too. Um, we did those cases and I'm going to have more cases even more than this for tomorrow night too because uh, no one knows what we're going to run into on um, 
our exams starting on the 15th, and I want to make sure y'all are well prepared for those more than anybody else and can just rock that test 100% and pass. But I hope this has been helpful, and I hope everybody has a safe night, and I will see y'all either in our chat room, which is super helpful. If you are not part of my free chat group, please message me on Facebook Messenger at Jen Brewer, which is going off right now. It's the same profile pic as here on TikTok, and same spelling of the name. Let's see. And you can be part of our Messenger group, too. It's super fun and full of information. We got people chatting away in it all day today. We share questions. We um, share everybody's victories. As you can see, we work on questions every day for the CPC exam, a HEMA exam, um, CCS, CCA. We all work on everything. They share parts of your book. Thank you, Coupon Cutie. And... Um, if you're just not part of this group, you really should be. Come find me on Facebook Messenger at Jen Brewer and ask to join. If you want to do tutoring like Irene is doing tomorrow, you can schedule that at my website at Medical Coding by Jen. And um, you can join um, for a one-on-one -on -one session with me before you're ready for your exam. And um, I will make sure your books are good and prepped. And you can do questions like this um, with me. It's super helpful. It really does. Congratulations again to Paris, who passed her exam on New Year's Eve. She did tutoring with me that night, and then that morning before work, she got up at 1 in the morning or something and took two parts of her exam that morning before she went to work and passed. So, great news. My last tutor person of the year passed her exam on the last day possible for 2021 so that's a great way to end the year and we are going to start the year with everybody passing their exam starting the 15th right guys everybody's going to pass i know she was the one with the zero she had a zero for ever what what's today's date seventh she had a zero um, on her results for seven days she had to call them freaking out and make them manually redo um, her exam and when they manually recalculated her exam she passed she passed so yay congratulations Paris and um, tutoring definitely helped I showed her to add her anesthesia she didn't know to do that yet she hadn't been with us for very long and that section was pretty lengthy in her exam because she had the old exam for 150 questions so that helped out a whole bunch, she said. So anyway, um, tutoring, go to YouTube, which is Coding by Jen for the repeat lives. There's hours and hours and hours of these type of situations in them on YouTube. And I have new TikToks available today that have some cases on them so that you can review and see how to answer these new 10 questions that we're going to have at the end of our exams. Let me know in any comments, either here on TikTok or on Messenger, if you have any questions. I'm always around. Don't forget, Etsy has that 30-page document that will turn your 2021 books into 2022 books, and you can absolutely use them all year long for 2022 for any exam retakes. So you don't have two books, and you can absolutely use them all year long for 2022 for any exam retakes so you don't have to buy other um, books that is absolutely allowed as long as it's just one year prior back so let me know if you have any questions or need any confirmation documentation of those kind of things i'm happy to share what i've got good night guys have a good night